Welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mary Ashen. Thank you for joining us today. In 1977, Dan Glickman became the first Jewish congressman to represent the state of Kansas. A grandson of immigrants from Russia and Eastern Europe, Glickman's career in public service took him from Wichita to Washington to Hollywood and back home. Glickman served nine terms as a congressman representing Kansas' fourth district until 1995. He served on the Agriculture Committee as a voice for Kansas farming communities. Following his time as a representative, he became the first Jewish Secretary of Agriculture, serving from 1995 to 2001 under President Clinton. Immediately following his departure from government, he led Harvard University's School of Government and Institute of Politics, and since then, he's worked at universities, national nonprofits, think tanks, and as chairman and CEO of the Motion Picture Association of America, succeeding the legendary Jack Valenti. Dan Glickman is currently senior fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center, adjunct professor of agriculture and nutrition at Tufts University, and a board member of the World Food Program USA. And I'll be chatting with him today about his new book, just released today, entitled Laughing at Myself, The Education, My Education in Congress on the Farm and at the Movies. Dan, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thank you, Dan, for having me. Well, let's start at the beginning. Uh, could you tell us a little about your, your parents and your grandparents and how they came to live in Wichita? It's not New York City. It's not Philadelphia, not Chicago. How did they get there? Well, you know, my grandparents all came the traditional route from Eastern Europe. My grandfather grew up outside of Minsk and Belarus, and my grandmother uh, grew up in the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, in, near Linz, Austria, and um, they uh, somehow got to Kansas. Actually, they got to Kansas City because they had a cousin there. And then my grandfather, he used to say he was one of the first settlers in Kansas. He settled for 10 cents on the dollar. And so uh, humor was part of my parents' life. My grandparents, uh, they, they, they had this kind of natural shtick. If they'd lived on the, one of the coasts, they might have gotten gone into comedy, but they ultimately settled in Wichita. Um, my grandfather was president. of. We had two synagogues in Wichita. There are always two synagogues, even if there are 12 people. So we were the orthodox slash conservative slash pragmatic synagogue. Then there was the reform synagogue. And um, my dad went into the scrap iron business with my grandfather. Then he went into the oil business. And then we owned the local AAA baseball team. We were affiliated with the Chicago Cubs for 15 years. And so just uh, we had a, a good existence. I had a good Jewish education growing up, even from a small town of Wichita, which had about 250 Jewish families. Well, scrap metal certainly was a, a traditional business uh, for for immigrants. Uh, I'm from a, a town in New Hampshire, and there was a, a, a scrap dealer. Uh, the Crocker family was in was in that business. Um, and I suspect that, that they got into that business. This was one of those things like, you know, my grandfather was a peddler. If you couldn't speak English well, but you, you knew the business, you could you could carry it on. And it seems that uh, uh, your grandparents and, and your father uh, really built that business uh, into into something substantial. Speaking of baseball, they own the AAA team. Did you uh, were you ever interested in playing baseball? Was that a, a big interest of yours? No, no it's mostly hearing my dad's jokes. Like, why does it take longer to get from first base to second base than second base to third base? Because there's a shortstop in between. So uh, the, the baseball became the font of his humor. But no, my sport was golf, and uh, I was not really much of a, a ball player. Well, one might expect that uh, as a Kansan, your, your knowledge of the world of farming was acquired at an early age, but that wasn't necessarily the case, given the, the business that your folks were in. Um, tell us about how you got your agricultural education, how you came to learn about farming and, and then the broader picture uh, of, of agriculture and, and what it means to this country. Well, uh, obviously, our family wasn't in, involved in farming, but when my dad was in the scrap business, especially when he was, he was an independent oil and gas operator, I used to go out with him and we'd negotiate leases with farmers. Uh, and so I got to kind of appreciate these people who work the land. And you talk about a tough business. Being a farmer is about the toughest business. You got to deal with the weather and prices and you can't control them. And so when I got elected to Congress, I wanted to go I thought, well, I'd go on the Appropriations Committee or the Ways and Means Committee or something that was real glamorous. And my chief of staff 
who was my debate teacher in high school, said to me, she says, you're going to go on the agriculture committee because I said, she said, it's good for the state. She says, and it's going to help your political career a lot more than those other committees are going to do. So that's how I got into agriculture. And I became a, a student, studied it, uh, enjoyed it, became, recognized its importance. And it certainly had a lot to do with my future career. So when did your interest in elective politics manifest itself? I suppose I was, uh, let's say, a sixth grade president of Fabrique Elementary School, so it must have started there. I actually went to the Republican convention in 1964 as an aide to the Sedgwick County Republican Party and carried cans of AUH2O, gold water, uh, you know, like I was a flunky. But I you know, it was kind of a moderate, didn't really, wasn't sure what political party I was in, but I ran for the school board in Wichita and I was elected and that was a nonprofit office. And I was on the school board for three and a half to four years before I then decided, pretty being pretty ambitious, saw an opening, ran for Congress, ran against an incumbent Republican and defeated him. And that's how I got in. Uh, when you went to law school, you came to Washington. Uh, did that experience in Washington uh, further propel you in the direction of elective politics? Yeah, first of all, I, I decided to go to law school in Washington because I like politics. I also worked all three years of law school with, for a Republican senator named Peter Dominic from Colorado. I don't know if you remember that name or not, but yep. Yep. long time ago and conservative Republican, handsome guy. And I was I started as a flunky. And then I became very good friends with one of his legislative assistants, Brian Lamb, who founded C-SPAN. And uh, he, were, he was the senator's press aide. And then I stayed on and signed the auto pen, worked the mail, and then ultimately became a legislative assistant. And so, yeah, I don't think there's any question that it inspired me into politics. Well, although a lot of people uh, probably wouldn't connect a career in law and politics uh, to a good sense of humor, uh, your book, the title of your book, and, and seemingly your life is filled with humor and, and the ability, as you say, to laugh at yourself. Uh, did this type of, of self-deprecating humor uh, reveal something about what it took to become a successful political leader like yourself? Well, I don't know. You know, I was a middle child, so I think I always used self-deprecating humor to fend off my brother and my sister who were older and younger. And, and you know, it was a way for me to resolve conflicts was to be funny. But um, and maybe, you know, it, who knows, maybe I was the only Jewish kid in my class and one of the two or three in the high school. And so I used humor as a way to get people to like me. But I did find that my parents were very funny, and my uh, both of them. My dad was a Rodney Dangerfield kind of funny. My mother was more of an authentic, natural kind of funny. And I, I saw how successful humor was in their lives, how they made friends, how they got business, um, and how... And so, and so it just became a kind of a, a, not only a shtick for me, but it became an avenue by which I would win friends and influence people. And we live in a rather humorless society today. Our politicians are often devoid of humor. And as I studied history, you look at great Americans in politics over the years, most of the ones who had impact were people who had great senses of humor. You look at your presidents, you look at Lincoln, Roosevelt, Kennedy, Reagan, and whether you agreed with them or not, they used humor to as a leadership tool. And so that's kind of and that's what we're missing today. And certainly, in my judgment, the Trump era was the was the low point in, in terms of the, in the evolution of humor in American political life. Your political career is really one of firsts. You were the first Jewish congressman in Kansas history, uh, the first Jewish secretary of agriculture. What did these milestones mean to you and, and your family? Uh, and was this your fulfillment of the American dream? Is that what you, what you thought this, this was as it began to play out? Well, I think so. But I also, uh, uh, you know, being Jewish was actually, I viewed it as an asset as I was, as I was growing up. I'm, you know, I'm sure there was a fair amount of subterranean anti-Semitism that was there, but it never impacted me. I was elected nine times. Being on the Agriculture Committee helped me because being associated with farming issues, I think, was a was a positive thing. You know, I mean, Bill Clinton used to say, where else in America could you have a Jewish secretary of agriculture promoting the pork industry? So, you know, I was like I didn't eat it, but I was a big advocate for it. Um, but I also uh, I've thought of myself as an ambassador to some extent to 
the Jewish people carrying on a, a tradition of leadership and and um, and you know I think that motivated me to to some degree. But there's no question that you have to have what I call quiet ambition, uh, and and I think that probably just came from my parents' encouragement as much as anything. You know, it's uh, it's interesting. In 1974, Stephen Isaacs, who then worked at the Washington Post and later became uh, the editor of the Minneapolis Star wrote a book called Jews in American Politics. And it was basically a compilation of articles that he had written. And uh, he went around and he interviewed Jewish political figures. At that time, there were three Jewish senators. Uh, there were Javits and Ribikoff, and I think Howard Metzenbaum was serving uh, a vacancy, filling a vacancy at that point. And there were about a dozen Jewish members of the House, uh, half of which came from New York or the New York area. But it wasn't long after that, 1977, when you were elected. Um, Ron Wyden uh, from Oregon, uh, uh, Warren Rudman uh, served in the Senate from New Hampshire, states with small Jewish populations uh, began to produce uh, elected officials uh, who were Jewish. And in Isaac's book, he interviews one person who says, well, look, you know, we, we don't really want to be up front. We don't want to be candidates, to be behind the scenes, strategic advisors, uh, fundraising, the kinds of things that, you know, we, we do well. Uh, but not necessarily as candidates. That really changed. And now we've seen from many different states in many different places. When you look back at that, you were really in that in that first wave. Uh, how do you how do you view that that shift? You know, I, I, I'd say a couple of things. Number one, as I said, it was never really an impediment. Number two, my parents gave me a lot of confidence and I never really dwelled on the fact that I was Jewish as part of my political life, but I never ran away from it either. I mean, obviously, I couldn't with my name and my face. It was not possible to do that. But um, I, I just think that by and large, the American people overall have been uh, uh, open. And, and you know, not every minority group has benefited from it. But certainly, there, you mentioned there are many others that uh, there was Steve Schiff, Martin Frost. You know, there's just whole group of people who represented small population centers who, who were Jewish. And, and I just think people didn't really care that much about what their religion was. Um, and that's a really, that's a healthy thing if you look at the history in America, because that's not replicated in many other countries in the world. Well, throughout your uh, political career, you kept cordial relations with uh, folks on the other side of the aisle. Um, who were some of the leaders of your generation with whom you became close. And, and now let's talk about bipartisanship because we seem really to have lost it. Uh, this is something that we all prided ourselves on. You said that our system of, of governance only works uh, with the grease of compromise and consensus. Um, and it's so important. I mean, I remember, uh, speaking of Kansas, uh, Bob Dole and Ted Kennedy, I think, had a, a radio program uh, on NPR where they you know, went back and forth. We don't have that anymore. Um, you speak a lot about bipartisanship and the ability to widen one's perspective, to learn uh, and to change from giving both sides of the argument an objective hearing. How do we use that uh, to move forward in America? You know, there's no major piece of legislation, if you look historically, that's been adopted that sustained itself that hasn't been bipartisan. So all the, from Social Security to, to all the civil rights legislation, um, and a lot of it depends on leadership. So you talk about my own state. I was uh, uh, cl close, but not terribly close with Bob Dole because we were on opposite sides of the aisle. And I think he always felt I was going to run against him, which I never was did because there was no way I was going to beat him. But we developed a close personal relationship on issues affecting Kansas. So a lot of that was agriculture. And then I'm from Wichita, where we produce a lot of airplanes, Beach, Cessna, Learjet. And, and uh, so I, I learned that to get things done, you had to deal with people on the other side of the aisle. And, and uh, e even with the partisanship that existed in the 70s and 80s and 90s, it wasn't toxic. And most of the big things that were done were done in a bipartisan way. It's changed. Why has it changed? I don't know. Maybe it's the 24-hour media cycle. Maybe it's the metastasis of money in politics, which often is used to denigrate your opponent. Um, you know, your your adversary has become your enemy, not your opponent. And um, that that kind of character has what it's done. It's led to a gridlock. 
And it's also led to the lack of public trust in government. And that's where I go back to the humor, because humor is one of the ways it can grease the skids. So um, people will like you, you'll get along with each other. It, it, not, it not alone will it change the world, but without it, uh, you, you know, you'll end up with not having a human side of the picture, which you need in politics desperately. And Dole was a perfect example. He worked with Kennedy. He worked with Birch Bayh. You know, he worked with to get things done. And um, uh, that is fairly rare today. It still exists, but not like it used to. Yeah, well, I think it's, uh, it's not only in the realm of politics, unfortunately, and I think the Internet has contributed to this. It's a lack of civility, uh, just to put broadly, uh, and um, we've got to restore it uh, one way or the other. And you know, we look to leadership, and uh, now very few are out there encouraging a return to civility and a return to bipartisanship. So we hope that uh, folks will uh, take note of the lessons in your book. Uh, on on how to restore and the work that you've done uh, since since leaving Congress to continue to promote the idea of bipartisanship. You know, it's like, for example, I, I'm very involved in global hunger issues, domestic hunger and global hunger issues. Those are very bipartisan issues. And as ironically, there are as many Republicans involved in those issues as Democrats. So it's one of those issues that we've been able to reach across the aisle on. Uh, but it's become a rarity. I mean, I'm not being overly nostalgic to tell you that things were all that much better in the 70s and 80s, but they were somewhat better. And, uh, you know, I remember when I was a freshman congressman, 1977, Hubert Humphrey, former vice president, then senator, spoke to a session of the House. It was the first time a sitting senator had ever been invited to address the House alone. And he said, fight every, he was dying of cancer at the time, but he said, fight every battle like it was, it's the most important battle that you've fought in your life. But after it's over, whether you win or lose, go shake the hand of your opponent. He or she is not your enemy because you are going to need that person for the next battle you fight. You, and it was something that just stuck with me all these years. Uh, uh, that's the great strength of the American political system is your ally, your adversary today may be your ally tomorrow, but that's only if you don't burn bridges. Well, while you uh, were still at the top of your game, you pivoted and you became head of the Motion Picture Association of America. Uh, with uh, your predecessor, Jack Valenti, leaving such an indelible mark uh, on the industry, what were your goals uh, for yourself and for the movie industry uh, at what was really a pivotal, a pivotal point um, in, in the industry? Well, you know, it's very interesting. Jack decided to retire. I'd been on the Judiciary Committee, so I'd worked on piracy issues and intellectual property issues and loved movies, but really didn't know very much about the industry. So Jack retires, and he and the headhunter decided that I would be a good successor. Jack wanted somebody of, quote, stature to replace him. And um, so um, I got the job, and it was almost like in the movie The Candidate. Remember, Robert Redford says, okay, yeah. now what do I do? So uh, um, I got into this business. I didn't know a lot of people in it. My son is a successful movie producer, and he had started before I got into this business. And he, has been, he was the president of MGM, the film division, for 10 years. He just retired from that. Retired. He's only 51. But he formed his own film production company. So... Um, it was quite a transition for me, not so much in the subject matter. I knew the, the, the subject matter fairly well, but it's a whole different world of dealing with agriculturalists than dealing with uh, studio executives. Um, and um, um, it's, it was a challenge, but I have to tell you, it's, it's, it's really one of the great strengths of America, the, the cultural aspects of film and television. And I was really glad to have had a, a small partner. Well, you said that uh, you went from growing popcorn to selling popcorn, so yes, uh, yes. that that gives us the the length and breadth of your of your career. Uh, Dan, I want to talk uh, just a little bit about uh, agricultural policy. Um, you did so much uh, to extend, open up uh, markets for American agriculture. Um, we've had uh, some ups and downs uh, in in recent years. Uh, how do you see that picture today? Actually, I see it uh, with the glass half full, not half empty. And part of the reason is new technologies are making it much easier for uh, find new kinds of crops to fight climate change, 
to improve nutrition. Um, and um, uh, we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years, massive consolidation in agriculture, far fewer small uh, farmers, much larger agribusinesses. But I, I, I see the future uh, actually much better. Uh, we're, we're finding ways, for example, to grow plants that use half the water. The Israelis have led the way on that in terms of drip irrigation, but uh, water is the most precious commodity of all in agriculture. And we're now learning how to how to have an agriculture that uses far less water. It's more uh, resilient. It's more uh, uh, climate positive. And, um, you know, agriculture is an expensive proposition. It, 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 you've had so much consolidation because you needed to scale up in order to buy this massive amounts of equipment and everything else. But but we're seeing also thing changes like more farmers markets, more direct marketing of agriculture to farmers, more indoor agriculture. So you know, I, I think it's a it's there's a good opportunity for uh, entrepreneurs in agriculture. You know, back in the old days, the movie business uh, used to say the secret word of the movie The Graduate, remember, was plastics. Yeah, and I don't think that's the secret word anymore, particularly in this age that we live in now. But I think one of the secret words is food and agriculture. People are really interested in it. They want to know what's in their food, where it's grown, how safe it is, and that offers great opportunities. You know, as as kids, we remember seeing pictures um, that occasionally of uh, shipments of of rice or wheat that went to countries that that needed food. There had been some natural disaster or perhaps a drought or something, and it would be a gift of the uh, of the United States of America or the people of the United States of America. Uh, what role do we have as Americans uh, to uh, be the engine uh, that uh, drives uh, assistance to places that, that really need this kind of help? We have a huge role. In fact, one of my Joys is being a part of a group called the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, headed up by a woman named Liz Schreyer, who you probably know, who was the political director of APEC uh, for years. And this is a group that's focused on American engagement in the world and that we need to be engaged, particularly with the developing world and particularly with our diplomatic efforts, that it strengthens America for having a strong development assistance program to not only help feed hungry people during a, an epidemic or a or a famine, but also to help sustain self uh, self sustaining growth overseas. And you know we still have about eight hundred million people who grow who go hungry every day in this world. And so the, the U.S. has an important role. And I tell you who's taking our position during the Trump years. There was a there was a retrenchment to some degree. And U.S. foreign assistance, not military assistance, but development and uh, diplomatic assistance. And the Chinese have moved in. You go to, for example, you go to Africa, you go to East Africa, and you see the Chinese building ports in Kenya and Tanzania and in West Africa. And so if we're not careful, we're going to lose our place in terms of uh, leadership in, in the developing world. And so, yeah, we have a great reason not to disengage from the global the global world. Well, in the book, you identify four key attributes of success. Why do you believe the principles that guided you through life can guide us through reconciliation and our common goals as well? For example, a strong sense of humor and the ability to laugh at oneself, which you've talked about. Respect and civility for those who have different points of view, which we mentioned. A belief system founded on values based on the golden rule, and a steadfast commitment to solve problems rather than create irreconcilable conflicts. So how can we take the four and, and move it forward uh, to, to create a better place for ourselves? It's tough. I would not, I'm not going to tell you that I'm a Pollyanna about all these things. I've learned that most members of Congress, most people in politics, not all, but most, are, are people of good character and want to do the right thing. But the environment and the atmosphere doesn't lend itself to conciliatory thinking. It's tri It's become very tribal. And the other thing is, is that uh, to uh, the nature of our media today is uh, different than it was when I was in politics. You know, the nature of the media today is, is that you tend to watch those things that agree with you rather than getting a variety of opinions in which you can make a judgment based on conflicting uh, data. 
So it's a lot tougher than it used to be. It requires much more exquisite leadership at all levels, not just at the political level, but at the business level, the faith-based level, the NGO level. Leadership makes a huge difference. We also need better civic education at the high school level. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of the old Jay Leno show. He used to have jaywalking and he'd ask these people the questions like, who's the president of the United States? And somebody would answer Albert Einstein. And I never I, I never knew whether that was uh, part of the production technique or whether it was true. But it is the truth. The most American high school students could not pass the citizenship test that people have to take when they come into this country. So we, that there, there's, there, there's just several areas that we need to work on and maybe having national service as well, which is something that um, it's tough to do because I don't think the American people will ever go for mandatory national service. But uh, uh, th those who served in the military usually come back finding that those uh, qualities that they learned uh, helped them in life become better citizens. Well, there's one more thing. Along with uh, the guiding principles, you say one of the biggest keys to your success has been resiliency. How did resiliency take you from where you began in Kansas to where you are today? You know, my, my, my dad or somebody used to tell this story about the businessman who would um, uh, went to talk to a group of students and he, the students were not very wealthy like he was. And he says, I just have one piece uh, uh, of advice for you. And, and that is when one door closes, another door opens. And a kid says, but that's great for you to say, you've made all this money. How do you know when that happens? He says, you don't. And that's why you have to be standing by the door all the time. And so resilience is often just taking advantage of opportunities and using your imagination. And, um, and, you know, the, it's worked for me. And I've had my ups and downs in politics. I've lost and lost my last election. I had, you know, issues uh, when I was secretary and other things. I mean, nothing all that serious. But I found that uh, being adaptable made a big difference in my life. Well, finally, uh, you've had such a, a very highly accomplished career thus far, really a man of parts. What would you say are your proudest achievements? and what can we expect from Dan Glickman going forward in the future? You know, I don't know. You know, my proudest achievements are I have a nice family, a good family. And, you know, it came from a good family. And I hope to keep that uh, tradition going as uh, as anybody would want. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, while I was in the Department of Agriculture, I, I worked very hard on the issue of discrimination against black farmers. That's still going on. But um, I moved the ball forward rather significantly, and that was a major achievement. Uh, um, you know, I'm, the, the, it, it, and then when I was at the Motion Picture Association, I improved the rating system. So the rating of movies is a lot more transparent than it used to be. I mean, you never know what, what is monumental in your life. I, probably the the best thing I'm most proud of is when I was a congressman. I just I helped average people, not not rich people, but average people, with, as they had to deal with their problems of getting their social security and and you know and and all sorts of issues ha having to deal with the with the government. And uh, that 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 certainly has helped me. And it's it's really nice. Even as I write this book, I've been out of politics a long time now. And the number of people who have written me and said, you know, you got my mother her Social Security in 1979 and it changed her life. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, the old expression from the Talmud, if you save one life, you save the world. Well, you know, I like to think that that's been part of my life during my entire experience. Well, the book is Laughing at Myself, My Education in Congress, on the Farm and at the Movies by Dan Glickman. And it's available in store or online wherever you purchase books. Dan, thank you so much uh, for joining me and talking with us about your book on release day and the valuable lessons learned from your impressive career. Well, thanks, Dan. And thanks for your great work at B'nai B'rith, too. Well, many thanks to Dan Glickman for being on today and speaking to us about his book, Laughing at Myself. And thank you for tuning in to this conversation with B'nai B'rith. And if you enjoyed this discussion, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel, liking us on Facebook, and following us on Twitter. And be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn more about our important work. See you again soon. Take care.